Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Tiger Mining Report podcast. It's been a while. Hopefully everybody's doing well. I am Rohella Casillo. Alongside me is Chris Brown. And you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or to listen to podcast. Of course, you can subscribe to us on the Believe Network. And so all of, there's great podcasts on there ranging from NFL to NBA, every sport covered. We got you in between. So this is our spring training. I just got back from Lakeland two days ago, and I did the drive Saturday night into Sunday evening. And Chris, let me just say this, and then we'll get to the podcast. First and foremost, if you're going to drive by yourself down I-75, I'm sure some people have that are listening out there. Do yourself a favor. Stop at Bucky's. That is a fantastic. It was the, the most insane gas station I've ever seen in my life. But secondly, most importantly, make sure that you drive a nice bigger car. I drive a small car. I drive a small SUV. It's a Kona. So it's not that big. And when you try to sleep and catch a cat nap in there, just make sure you're properly prepared for that kind of thing. That's it. It was still a great time. So prop, I want to give th- thank you to Sherry. Thank you for everybody who donated to the Tiger Minor League Report Patreon, or excuse me, the GoFundMe, and also to our PayPal account. You can donate. There's a link below too as well in the show description. We're still going to try to do more trips. Or hopefully one of us gets down the spring breakout. I'm going to try to pull that off. Maybe even do a day tri- yeah. day drive for that. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's uh you turn yourself basically into a long haul trucker doing that drive by yourself, right? Like except you don't have that fancy cab to sleep in. But uh yeah, I mean that's that's a heck of a I, I was shocked to see that you know, you sent me a picture from Atlanta, like you were it was like nine in the morning, I'm like, geez, when when did you leave? You're like, Oh, the night before. I'm like, Wow. But I get it. I've done I've been there before where it's like, you know what, I'm just ready to go and I can I can do this. You can pull this off and you can will your body to do some, you know, tough stuff, but that's, that's such a long drive that you you hit a couple points. I'm sure where you're just like, oh boy, I gotta I gotta pull over and, and catch a nap because you know this isn't gonna work. There's only so much coffee you can drink. But yeah, glad you glad you made it. Glad you went down there. You sent me a lot of good videos that we were able to tweet out. A lot of good information, good stories. Uh, and yeah, it's always good to just for you know show your face down there, right? Absolutely. And I got a chance to see Brian Garko, who I got a chance to shake his hand and was. was Good to see Gabe Alvarez too as well. He kind of bear hugged me, so it was kind of nice to see. <laughs> nice, but uh, yeah, it was it was cool, and definitely in the chance to talk to Brian Pena, who is now a field coordinator, uh, catching coordinator. And so the weather was a little colder for that time of year, but still, it warmed up towards the tail end of this my trip there. And so I wish I was there a little longer, but duties calls. But there's plenty of information to work with and plenty to get to. As we go through our top 30, and so this is going to be our busy season. We're going to start off the busy season, so more videos, more content. Right now, it's just been kind of a sleeping giant kind of thing, if you will, but uh, rest assured, the content is on the way. So that being said, let's get into some of the – we're going to go to our top 30 and essentially just go through – I like how you structure this, Chris. So essentially, notes from what we've seen so far in spring training and, and anything I can fill in between from when I was down there. Yeah, and, and you know what? I, I also I, I kind of started off with also just just keeping track of a bunch of the minor leaguers who are who didn't make our top thirty, but they're guys we've been covering for a couple of years, and, and they were doing some things. And a lot of them haven't done a whole lot yet. You know, Navigado uh, zero for two with a walk and a strikeout, and had the unfortunate uh, boot, literal boot, that caused the inside the park home run against the Rays the other day. But that wasn't through a lack of effort, right? He dove for the ball and just a really freak play and kicked it. But um, other guys, let's see, we got, you know, Austin Murr and Eliezer Alfonso, who each had an at-bat. Corey Joyce has played in the game but didn't get an at-bat. Carlos Mendoza is over three. Donnie Sands is over four. Daniel Cabrera got in the game today and walked and scored a run, but that was it. Um, Just just going through these, you know, kind of, like I said, the, the guys that didn't quite make our list. It's and it's so early that we're really not going to learn a whole lot of from any of this stuff, but just want to give these guys uh, a notice that we're watching, we're paying attention. Adam Wolf came in in relief uh, the other day, inning a uh, third of an inning, gave up a hit, get, had a strikeout. Austin Bergner threw in a scoreless inning, 
And I, I had thought that he retired, but uh, he did not. And he's in spring training. And then Bryce Johnson and Lyle Lockhart each have pitched one third of an inning. But then, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and the Tigers did sign a catcher today by the name of uh, Jose Siberian. The, he's a 25-year-old native of Venezuela. Yeah, I saw that. You know what? He, I, I actually put him – I saw that last night when I was doing uh, – but I thought it was earlier, but maybe it was yesterday. I, I don't I, – I, um, I was doing – trying to do the roster projections, and I was like, who's this guy? And, he, yeah, I was like, I, I don't know. We'll throw him at West Michigan for now. <laughs> I know, it kind of feels like another Alonzo Rubel Caba guy, like you know, just kind of a bullpen catcher slash emergency catcher, but we'll see. Um, and then some of the other guys, Trey Cruz, 0 for 2 with two walks, been playing center field. He can walk. We know that. Uh, Gage Workman, 2 for 3 so far with a double. Uh, and Jake Olton, 1 for 3 with a double. Ben Malgeri, 1 for 3 with an RBI. And then Brady Allen, 1 for 3 with two strikeouts and a three-run opposite field home run. Uh, the other day, basically the big blow in their game against the Astros, and they won four nothing. And as uh, you know, we tweeted out that he had 19 home runs last year. In about the middle of the year, he started hitting them all basically to the opposite field. I think 10 of them were to center or to right field. So, and he's a right-handed hitter, but he's a, he's an interesting player. You know, we 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 couldn't quite sneak him on our top 30 because I, for me personally, it's a, it's just the hit tool questions, and we like to see guys like that perform at Double A before we really move them up. Uh, but you know, he's one to keep an eye on, and it's always nice to see a, a guy like that get a home run in spring training. And if you have on your dance card that Eddie's Leonard would be tied with Cole Keith for the team lead in hits after three <laughs> games, and congratulations, you may have won some sort of lottery because Eddie's Leonard has had some really good hard hit balls already. He had a, his first hit of the spring came on Saturday against the Yankees where he kind of hit a rocket off third base, and it was, it was a legitimate hit went off the fielder but Cole Keith we'll, we'll get the we'll we'll shower the praise of Cole Keith in a second because that hit the first hit he had on Saturday was a thing of beauty we'll get to that but Justice Bigby also Chris uh two for two for seven already on the spring and Dylan Dingler with a uh, nice at bat the other day and it looks like he's gonna get some time although I believe he's it's injured right he just got cleared to uh, at least on the injury report today, was the he's cleared to start catching again. He's been playing DH. He had a little bit of minor, I think it was a minor elbow uh, procedure, and so he's getting cleared to catch again. So yeah, that's good. And uh, yeah, I mean it's it's again they've played like a handful of games, and none of these guys have been in more than three games. But we've you know some early performances or some early production. Um, yeah, you mentioned some of the, the big hitters. We you know like you said, we was just kind of doing reverse order for the top thirty. Uh, but unfortunately, the bottom, the bottom part of our our order, no, no uh, Chris Myers yet, no Luke Gold yet, no Tyler Madison yet. But Andrew Magno did pitch today in a very classic Andrew Magno inning. Uh, one <laughs> inning, no hits, two walks, and a strikeout. I believe that was the eighth inning against the the Orioles today. So nice to see him get out there. And uh, you know, early in the spring, command and control is kind of uh, always the question with him. And and you never know with pitchers early in the spring, especially guys who specialize in breaking balls it takes a little while to get that feel back i think so uh that was it for him and then uh yeah they, they, they no Josue Briseño was actually on the trip to baltimore today but i don't believe he got into the game and no, no sign of max anderson yet we haven't seen any of last year's draft picks yet and that's not terribly unusual for spring training right like it'd be, it'd be kind of odd if a bunch of guys from last year were getting a lot of playing time that would be a bad sign for the rest of the system yeah, I'm surprised we haven't seen Peyton Graham as of yet. Although he is in camp, there was we did get a request. Someone was asking about that on Tiger Minor Report on uh, Twitter. But as far as I, I think he didn't it was I think he was on the trip today too. I believe yeah, that's correct. Yep, he was on the trip uh, to Sarasota today. That is correct. And alongside him on the trip too was there was there was another name in there that I was. Thought that it would be gone in a system tune that was trying to throw me off. It was, I was trying to remember, was it? Oh, it, I'm sorry. It was it was Drew Anderson who I f completely forgot, and he had a nice what? debut, Chris. I mean, you you highlighted him earlier today. Yeah. Now this is, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens there because they signed him to a minor league deal, uh, as far as I can tell. Right? He's not. He's certainly not in the 40 man roster. 
Uh, but yeah, he came out and was was throwing 95 to 98 with a, a lot of spin, good spin rate on his fastball, high spin slider. He was he added like a cutter, a curveball, uh, and had a really efficient, you know, 20 strikes on 26 pitches. And and, and I don't think he gave up a hit. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's a guy that that. I don't know, early candidate to be like this year's Trey Wingenter. Like, I don't know, maybe he sneaks into the bullpen somehow. But if not, and if they can keep him, then he he might be, in the way he pitched today, he could be a closer in Toledo. Particularly if if Brendan White is, uh, you know, still rehabbing. Although the, the injury report today, I think, said that he's going to begin his throwing program. So that's good to hear. It's yeah, the, he starts the, at tomorrow, I believe. So it doesn't doesn't appear that his elbow soreness is, is uh, at least so far, isn't a severe issue. So that's good. But... Yeah, Drew Anderson. That was, you know, with a minor league report, right? We we not just all our top thirty prospects. We want to touch upon uh, talk about some other minor leaguers, and and he's the one that could be worth watching. So that was that was kind of fun, and that's it's always fun just early in spring. The other things we've seen, like Bo Brisky, his new slider, definitely is is a different pitch than it was last year. It's uh, a lot more spin and a little more uh, lower velocity, I think it is, but uh, and 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 more horizontal depth. So we'll see what, what happens with that. Sometimes this is all just kind of numbers, but, uh, and then, you know, just going back to our, the middle, you know, the, the 20 to 30 range is there's not a whole lot of action there, but, uh, what did we mention? Yeah, no Paul Wilson, obviously, but, but, uh, Andre Lipsius has played at several games. He's one for six with an RBI double and a walk and three strikeouts. Uh, he's had two games at first and one at third, which I think is basically, you know, we saw him in the outfield before. He's kind of a four corners guy, I would say, at this point. First base, third base, left field, right field. I don't really know <laughs> where he's going to play in in Toledo this year, but I think he'll be there. Uh, he may do all those things wherever they need him. Yeah, I, I think with depending on what they do with uh, Houston or Hira, where they're going to uh, put Kessin him. Because you hear who can DH. I mean, mm-hmm. I can see him being the DH, but then – what threw me in the threw me in the wrench today was the forty coming back because again from yeah. all accounts we haven't heard anything and they might make they might still make some final cuts too because again there's just seems like there's going to be as far as where you put Jake Holton at then and you know what I mean like there's just going to be a, a log yeah. jam of positional players between Erie and Toledo so yeah if if we treat Lipsius as a first baseman then that gives them five potential first base types between Erie and Toledo like you said you mentioned Hira. Um, Quincy Naporti, Chris Myers, Jake Holton, those are all guys who are going to be playing first base primarily. And, and, you know, Holton and Myers have played some outfield. Lipsius can play third and other positions. They can make it work. But hey, it's not something we talked before, right before the show is, is one of the hardest things to do when we're projecting these rosters is, is figuring out which of these older veteran types or sort of the organizational players. I know, you know, uh, Garko did not like that term, but uh, you know I think that it, it makes sense for for him to not use it, but it's fine for us. Uh, yeah, some of these guys are going to get released or going to seek employment elsewhere. Like they'll ask to be released because they have opportunities elsewhere, and it's just hard to figure out which who falls into which category. But in any event, uh, we've we've also seen our I believe twenty one prospect number twenty one, no twenty two. Ryan Kreidler has Ryan Kreidler. played in several games. He's one for five with two walks and a strikeout. But uh, already a couple of very nice defensive plays, at least, uh, you know, according to the radio. Those are ones we couldn't see on TV. It, it was interesting, too. He, he was part of the first. Ca- so when they started doing full training sessions on Monday and Tuesday, he was part of the first field, first wave of infielders that was out there. So he was out there with Cole Keith, Javi Baez, and Zach McKinstry. This was before the Gio Urshila signing. So McCryler was out there among the first group. Yeah, and and there's I I don't think there's a whole lot of debate like you know who the the second best or possibly you know you you could argue he might be as good or better than Javi Baez at shortstop, but I would say probably second best shortstop in in camp, and it's probably him. He's played shortstop, he's played some third base. We like Ryan Kreidler, we like the glove. It's always been a question if he can stay healthy, if he can hit. Um, and you know I don't know, like he's a, I suppose he's a dark horse to make the roster, but I I think he'll be back in Toledo playing shortstop every day or most yeah. every day. Or, I mean, you still have Eddie's Leonard, who, again, not bad at shortstop. I really, but then again, like, he has, he has, he's told us he will, he'll play wherever. He yes, doesn't I, care. I mean, 
he what basically I saw, was like, yeah, was it? He told Jeff Seidel anywhere. Doesn't, doesn't yeah, I, there was a, some quote about like where he wants to play, and he just said lineup. And it was yeah. like, all right, <laughs> okay, and and yeah, we we'll get to him in just a second. I mean, you already touched on him. he's our fifteenth prospect, and and this once we get into the top twenty, then this we got some interesting stories coming, and some some guys who've kind of made a little noise. Um, our twentieth prospect, Roberto Campos, actually got into the game today. Pinch ran. Uh, he'd get one at bat, and he he hit a slider, nine ninety seven point four miles an hour exit velocity, three hundred forty three feet. Uh, which was good to see. Uh, it was Navigado was on second, probably should have moved up to third, but he kind of misread it. He thought maybe it could have been, you know, a hit, so he didn't move up. But nice to see him make that level of hard contact and, and you know, get it up in the air against the slider. So, again, it's just one at bat, but that's all we have. And uh, from that, we'll say, hey, not bad, Roberto. And nice to see that he's back and healthy, right? We never did find out <laughs> why, why he missed. Oh, it was really shrouded in mystery, yeah. too. So, uh, but yeah, and, and so this is, this is the thing start getting interesting. So, so our 19th prospect is, is Brent Herter and interesting, you know, for a while we kind of were the high people on Herter and now we appear to be the low people <laughs> just the way it worked out. Um, and, and there was, it seemed like there was a fair amount of buzz. You were down there and it may have just been the way it works, but th there seems like there are a couple of players that, that it almost seemed like the front office was pushing as saying like, Hey, these guys are pretty interesting. And Herder was one of them and big was the other. And and I don't know if that you felt that down there, if that was just the way it worked out. Oh no, no, definitely. AJ Hinch spoke the first two days schoolingly about Brant Hurler and how he's done everything. The organizations have to none, ask him to do. He just goes out there and he said, said this about Flores too, that just goes out there. They just have to throw strikes. And Hurler did that he, at Saturday, which was a disaster as the first game, as far as that was goes, he was the only start. He was the only pitcher that really went in there and just threw strikes. That was it. I mean, it was he went there was the most efficient pitcher of them all. And what, like, in terms of how Hinch referred to him too, is just like just how he could. How about the ball club and everything? It wasn't just like lip service, but he. I had a chance to see him throw bullpen a little bit too, and it's just the same kind of. His mechanics are so smooth, and he, he's gotten better at repeating his motions consistently. So I, I think there's a little more smoke to fire, but the question is, I mean, do you put him out? How, is he a starter long-term? I mean, we always like to, I still think we're the high guys on him. I mean, we're the ones kind of saying, Hey, we, he uh, threw 13. I mean, he threw 13 scoreless innings last year in the postseason. And he was, he put that team on his back last year. And so, yeah, and it, yeah, he was a, a huge part of that championship club, and and he's been a, a good solid pitcher. Yeah, you know, I remember when our update, you know, he had a really awesome start to the year last year, and then things kind of fell apart. And then, but when you dug in just a little bit in the numbers, it was like, oh, it's basically the same. He he went from having pretty good luck to having really bad luck, and they they were both about the same in terms of strikeouts and and stuff like that. And yeah, to your point, he he. Gets the Yankees. His first inning of work was three ground ball outs, which is that's going to be what he is, right? Like he's 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 not a, a a solely pitch to contact guy, but he's going to make you pound it in the ground when you do make contact. And then the second inning, he got uh, two fairly quick outs. I'm I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah. And then unfortunately, a, an error from Witzel Perez. And then after that, he walked a guy, hit a guy, and uh, or he gave up a single. So yeah, he gave up a single, then an error, then a walk and a hit guy, and that led to a run. But he did strike out three in that inning. So two innings, one hit, one walk, one hit batter, one earned run, three strikeouts. And again, all, all that damage really came after the, the Winslow Perez error. So yeah, as you said, like four or five swings and misses too on there, something like that. Yeah. And it's you, you, the perfect point. Like that was an ugly game. I, I believe Dan Dickerson declared it the worst game he's ever seen in spring training uh, in 25 years. And, but Herter was the only one who was really pretty good. So, that's a good sign. You know, it, it's just spring training, but he didn't seem to be phased by the moment, uh, as it were. So, yeah, I, I think I agree with you. I think that the big question is, will they keep him as a starter? And if so, does he have to go back to Erie? Will they move him into, uh, will they have him as their left-handed starter in Toledo? Will they move him to the bullpen? These are all questions that they're up to Scott Harris and Jeff Greenberg and Ryan Garko and not us, but uh, I'll be fascinated to see what they come up with. Yeah, especially because it seems like they've, Try to load up as far as lefties go. I mean, just giving some uh, uh, some opportunities as far as like other levels go. So 
I, I don't know. I, I personally think he could be a good swing man, maybe take over the next uh, Tyler Alexander role now that he's in Tampa. It's yeah. same role, you know, we could think of that that way. But, but ch- as far as his stamina goes, too, I mean, this is a guy who I think was second or third among innings pitch last year in the minors, according uh, among Tiger minor league pitchers. I have to double check that. But nevertheless, made it. He made a really quick impression on there because what was interesting to him and or it was Ty Madden was told they were they're gonna make, not make the team immediately. But I haven't seen. I didn't see Ty Madden throw at all among maybe in the backfields a little bit, but I didn't see him go with the sessions with like the likes of Job or anything like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that is interesting. They didn't, Hinch didn't say that to her. So, uh, and that's a good point. Like there's, there's a real chance that uh, Joey Wentz, they just lose Joey Wentz. If, if they don't think that they can put Joey Wentz as their long man in the bullpen this year, and they, they try to get him through waivers. I, he seems like the sort of guy who's going to get snapped up, right? Like if, Colton Ingram got grabbed. Somebody's going to take a chance on, on Joey Wentz, not to you know demean Colton Ingram, right? But Joey Wentz is touching 95 with a cutter and a curveball and, and and some prospect pedigree there. So if they lose him, then Herter might be that next man up, that swing man. So that's a good call there. Um, yeah, especially because, I mean, Wentz is already in two innings worth five strikeouts, pair of walks. If you can get those walks, just slay it down. I mean, Wentz, I've always still... Maybe I'm the only person with this opinion. I still think Wentz has something to offer, pro- just not as a starter, perhaps, because you see when he gets goes through the third time through the order, he gets hit up pretty bad. So I, I don't know. Like if he can just air it out a little bit, maybe that will help his cause. But you're right, Chris. I don't see him if the Tigers put on waivers. He he'd be snatched up in a in a heartbeat. You could see somebody maybe already identifying something they can do to help his command too. Yeah, no, I, I think there's enough there that you would you would think a team. Yeah, I mean, it could be. It wouldn't shock me if it's a team like like even the Dodgers, the Rays, or somebody like that, right? Like like a, a good team says, "Hey, we can we can use this guy." So I think the Tigers are going to try to keep him. But if it doesn't work out, then then yeah, maybe that's Herder's role. Uh, and and I checked here, and uh, Herder tied for third in the minor leagues in terms of innings pitched last year. Montero was first, Jack O'Laughlin was second, and then Herder and Ty Madden both had 118. Um. And I, I think Reese Olson had more that more than that combined between the minors and the majors, but he's not a prospect anymore. So there you go. Yeah. Um, our 18th prospect, Isaac Pacheco, no sign of him yet. I know he was down there, but he hasn't been in a game yet. Um, I don't know if you saw anything from him. No, I just saw him. He was in camp. He was in camp yeah. pretty early. Uh, and then 17 is Dingler, who you touched on before. He's two for four so far with a walk and a strikeout. Not bad. Just cleared to start catching again, like we said. So he's been a DH right now. So. But it's good to see him getting making some contact, right? We that's the the big question mark with him is, is his ability to to hit. And then uh, sixteen, yes, is Winsel Perez, which is kind of ouch. Um, <laughs> yeah, we've talked before, and it just it felt like the yips came back immediately. Like I think that was his first chance of the season, and it was just a classic Winsel second base throwing error, just no accuracy. It was a routine ball, Chris. It was nothing like there was nothing. It was just a simple. He had all the time in the world. Set plant, and then he just went whoop. Then the second throw he had the first, same thing it was way over. Yeah. And so the first time he was able to turn a positive play was on a, I believe, on a double play, and he barely got over the first. And so it was one of those things where, and no, there and also there's a fly out, and he missed the fly ball too. Yeah, that, that was, was like yeah. the second error was the feeling error. Yeah, yeah, and I, and then so. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but he was he was playing center field. So he played second base, then they put him in the center field. And it, it, this wasn't egregious, but but when Wilmer Flores was on the mound, Flores got two really quick outs. And the the third one, and it was tough. This, you know, they say it's the hardest play for a center fielder, right? That the, the batter hit it straight straight forward and it sounded good, but actually hit it off the end of the bat. And and Perez took a step back and then realized and, and ran in and it was too late and fell for a single. And then Flores fell apart after that. Uh and you know, you don't want to kill Perez for that. He, obviously, he doesn't have a ton of time out in the outfield, but that was another kind of like, oh boy, that's not right. And and so he was DH today. But at the plate, he's been all right. <laughs> he's uh, he's uh, one for four with two walks and a strikeout. You know, that's kind of kind of him. Um, no extra base power yet, but 
I don't know. It's, it's a tough one because there's there's a lot of stuff to like there offensively, and we've seen some good things from him in the outfield. But uh, you just worry about the the defense getting into his head. It just seems like it, it's it's always like lurking back there. It really sucks. Yeah, which is why I was surprised that they started him at second base so quickly because I thought maybe they probably break him in a little bit. But I mean, then again, Hinch hasn't doesn't see these guys as much as we do, so perhaps or for anybody else for that matter. So it's just maybe a you know what we'll give him a chance to see what happens and well yeah I man i think we talked about it before is is he had that really rough stretch at second and they put him out in center and then after he, that he came back to second and was mostly okay i mean he, he was occasionally would have something but it wasn't that like oh god this is in his head it was just you know he was making the routine plays so i don't know like i said it's it's you <laughs> i hate to you know, trivialize it, but it's almost like he's like an alcoholic, right? Like, uh, oh, you know, he's he's been sober for th- three months. Everything's good. And like, uh-oh. <laughs> like, uh-oh, he's uh, back, he fell off the wagon again, and the throws are nowhere close to first. And so, I don't know. But, yeah, I don't know. We'll keep an eye on him. Hopefully, uh, they'll continue to move him around. Hopefully, he'll be fine for the rest of the spring. But it was it was a, kind of a, a rough debut. Uh, and then 15 is Eddie's Leonard, who you, you touched on earlier. Three for eight with a double, three RBIs, I think. A lot of hard contact, like you said, has played second shortstop so far. And, yeah, zero strikeouts, zero walks. And that's, I think, kind of who Eddie's Leonard is going to be. Like, not zero, zero forever, right? But but he's a, he reminds me a little bit of Andy Abanez. Just, just a guy who makes consistent hard contact. He's not going to walk a ton. He's not going to strike out a ton, hopefully. Um, and, yeah, he's, like you said, sure-handed defender so far uh I, I think maybe doesn't look like you doesn't look super fluid like a shortstop but uh he's if he can fill in there and with that sort of thump in his bat like that's it's surprising power so um yeah i, I don't know it's, it's a good start for him he's i think he's i don't know if he's opening eyes yet but he's like you know yeah there, i think he's gaining more believers yeah he's definitely opening up a lot of eyes for people who are not familiar with him and i i think the one of the things about Leonard too is that I think he has a much better eye at the plate, slightly better eye than Abanez does. Whereas sometimes with I mean Abanez has been getting better at when he can get to the lower part of the strike zone. That's where often that's his his weak spot. But I, I gotta say though, it was just seeing how Eddie's Leonard. The biggest thing too is that it doesn't matter. He can just hit it hard anywhere, so it's not like he's selective on where it goes. And, that, and that's what I like about him, too. Now, the, the question be, becomes, too, if he I, – I see him maybe perhaps being a guy you need regular at-bats for versus just a, a utility guy role, at least in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, you know, I would think that it's always tough to figure out who's going to be – like who can thrive in that role where they're they're basically playing every other day and moving around the field. That's, that's tough, and you don't want to do that for – Leonard is, what, 23? Is he even 24 I just, yet? I just, I just think he just turned 23 from my understanding. Um, so, yeah, you got a long, young kid. Yeah, he's born November 2000. So, yeah, he's he's won't turn 24 until after the season. So, yeah, pretty pretty young. I th- I agree with you. I, I think, um, you know, that I saw some, something, maybe it's MLB.com, said he was a dark horse candidate to make the roster, and that's fun. But I think he's probably better off playing every day in AAA. And then if they need him, then he could be one of the first guys up. So and it's nice to have a, a bat like that where you've, you've got a guy who can make some really hard contact and do some damage. So, yeah, good good start for him. Uh, our 14th prospect is Troy Melton. He's not uh, – he hasn't pitched yet. He probably won't. He may get an inning in spring or something like that. But, like, him and, and Job, as much as we want to see them pitch, I think they're like – Okay, well, let's not waste these innings in spring training, guys. Yeah, <laughs> and I get it. That's that's fine. Uh, yeah, I'd love to see those guys pitching and and you know on track man and stuff. But um, now thirteen is is arguably the uh, kind of the the early story of the prospect camp, I guess. Uh, one of the at least the more noteworthy appearances, and that's that's Wilmer Flores. And I touched on it a little bit with the the Wilson Perez uh, issue, but. Uh, yeah, immediately Flores is out there, and the beat writers start tweeting out that he's touching 98 and 99 repeatedly on the, the stadium gun. And unfortunately, no stat cast. We have no idea how accurate that is. But during today's game, Dan Dickerson was talking, and he said that they talked to A.J. Hinch about Flores hitting 98. So it, it seems like that was a real thing. 
and apparently they, they, it's something to do with Robin Lund where they're basically, as Dan was explaining it, like they're learning that, yeah, if you just move your body faster, you can throw faster. <laughs> and I was like, what? Uh, is something basically something like you're, you're bringing yourself through, you know, over the mound faster and, and, uh, and like that, that was the big thing with Flores last year, right. Was, was the, the velocity kind of disappeared. Right. We, and- we saw 95, 97 in 2022. And then last year it was 92, 94, maybe most starts 91, 93. I think also, I think he was preoccupied. This is my opinion too, but this is something we, I talked to him about last year. He was learning how to throw that change up because that change up was going to make him. And he feels and in, in he mentioned this, that he should have been already in the big league club already. Mm-hmm. That's how confident he was about his ability. He lost weight. He cut his hair. So he's got short hair. And he, he lost like he, I mean, significant pounds. He looks skinnier. Camp, same thing with Mason Englert, who lost. Mm. I, looked, I didn't even recognize Mason Englert there. But as far as Flores goes, yeah, I mean, that is that is interesting that just simply moving faster, like you're like some sort of comic book character, like the Flash or something, that's going to cause this to happen. He's got the but speed force, he's got the speed force, yeah. <laughs> but it's what Hinch was talking about that he has to fill the zone and throw strikes, and. His secondaries are still going to, are still pause for concern. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we could talk about the velocity all day long and, and it really, you know, for at the first outing, it's, it's fine, I guess. Right. You don't care too much, but uh, yeah, he's just a guy. He, he He's listed at six, four. I think he just looks much bigger than that. Because I think because of his long arms and kind of long arm action. Uh, but regardless of how hard he thrown, he, he wasn't missing a ton of bats with the fastball. He was getting some fouls, and he just he didn't really have feel for his breaking balls. He did get, like I said, he got the first two outs pretty quickly, and the second was uh, a strikeout looking on a pretty good curveball or his slower breaking ball, yeah. However you want to define it. Um, and slide. then there was then there was that weak hit uh, to center that that Perez couldn't get, and then after that was it was uh, three consecutive hard hit doubles, and he was he was he just really looked uncomfortable out of the stretch to me. Yes, that's he kind of starts spraying it everywhere, and the breaking ball wasn't breaking. And uh, you know, like I said, it's 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 one outing, and he gave up four four hits and four earned runs. Uh, it's not not going to look good on the ERA, but if he's throwing harder, that's probably a good sign down the road. We will we'll have to see. But like two years ago, he threw a ton of strikes. Right. And last year, that backed up a little bit. The velocity backed up a little bit. So it's kind of hard to know what he what we're going to get from him this year. But he could. If he's right and he's throwing hard, he could, you know, rock it to the big leagues, I think. Or he could be a bullpen guy. It's it's uh it's hard to judge. Yeah, and Hinch yeah, Hinch mentioned like him similar earlier. He's just gotta throw strikes consistently. And it's just he's like as simple as it sounds, it's true with, with Flores. And we know and, and they know they have something with Flores, which is why he got added to the 40 man. So keep that in mind. That's something that he has a possibility of either coming out of the bullpen or a start, but they're not going to define that role as of yet too, which kind of leads to number. I mean, we, we haven't seen Lee in camp yet. Who was a number 12. He, he got in today. He got as a punch pinch runner and, and went over one with a fly out to center. But yes, okay. that was, we it's, you know, we probably won't see more than a handful more plate appearances from him. We're talking about a guy who's probably heading back to high a to begin the year. So yeah, and hopefully we'll get some more. We'll get some more. We didn't really see a lot of West Michigan either before he got injured, too. Oh, I think nine at bats or something yeah. like that. So I'm glad we went out and saw him early on. Justice yeah. Bigby has been also been a big story, too. He's been hitting the ball pretty well. He is third among spring trainers and hits number 11. And, and Bigby's story continues to be, and I, it was, I think it was Cody Saberhagen, did a really good, nice, did a really great story on his mother. Yeah. And just that was really amazing to hear. What he's been through the young man but the thing is chris is that especially i think he had that his first hit too was i think it was runners on scoring the score or he had a, i think there was two runners on on that on that first hit he had it's just it just for verbatim looked like exactly what he did at west michigan and erie last year when there's runners on he always was able to it felt like he was able to get those R, rbi knocks he's yeah he's just got a knack for scoring up the ball it's something that we've you know, he just he's got a feel for hit, and he he pulled the ball to left field. I think one of his hits, and the other one was an RBI, kind of, you know, lined it past the shortstop. And he's had more hard contact since then. He's he's two for seven. 
uh, it, but it's been pretty consistent hard contact. Uh, he had to line out. And um, and interesting, you know, he's he's had a fair amount of chances on defense already in the corner outfield, and I thought he did a, a pretty good job of battling the sun, which can get just about anybody in spring training. And he looked solid out there. He got an assist, I think, today from the outfield. Uh, you know, he, he somebody shot the gap, and he threw it into ba- Baez, and Baez threw the guy at home. So, I don't know. It, yeah, it's it's – I do think that it seems like the organization believes in him and thinks that the, he, he can hit for real. Uh, and uh, I tend to agree. I, it's just I, like I've seen him hit and hit a ton. I, it's just such a, a, a strange, not strange, but unique hitting profile with the, the amount of opposite field contact that it's hard for me to judge. But so far this spring, it's been mostly pulled early on. So maybe he's made some adjustments there. And if he does that, then then look out. Yeah, and I think he'll step out of the shadow a little bit too of yeah. Kerry Carpenter because they both had the same hitting instructor. So that's been well, kind of big storyline. You know, so you know what's weird? Like I, I keep hearing that, and it, but he didn't. You know, we interviewed him, and I thought we asked him. You know, what he changed, and I don't remember him saying he. You know, went and visited Richard Schenk. But uh, no, I don't. No, that's that, that was the just, thing that blew me off. Like I was like, wait, I don't remember him saying that at all. Yeah, but I mean that they're reporting it so it's it probably is true maybe we just didn't know to ask him i also didn't know to ask him about you know his mom <laughs> uh but like i don't know that that's not the sort of thing you ask uh at that at that time he was his face was still all busted up from getting hit oh yeah in, no, in the head by a fastball. yeah um but uh yeah no he's he's a, a good dude and, and it's fun to see him continue to make some noise um and then our number 10 uh pitcher is ty madden who pitched today and uh, again, no stat cast, no TV, no radio. We really have no idea what happened, but it was very much a time add and outing. One and two thirds, two hits, two walks, two strikeouts, no runs. Um, I was trying to look for a pattern there. You know, like, oh, was he walking and giving up hits to the lefties? And no, it was just kind of a little bit of everything. So yeah. again, he already knows he's not making the team, but they gave him uh, basically two innings, right? And, and so they're giving him some chances and, He's, he's got more to work on, but uh, consistency is the big thing. But again, first outing, you don't want to make too much out of anything. Same thing with the injury to number nine, sort of Gibson Long, who self reported the injury to Hinch, by the way. That was something that Hinch mentioned uh, first day of camp that he came up to him and said, Hey, I'm, my hammy's been bothering him. So he's been bothered by a left hamstring injury, which is why we yeah. haven't seen yet in camp. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and, and Hinch said, like, I'm glad he told us because the uh you know if you don't report that and things get worse and you could really threaten your season so he was glad and and it, it sounds like it's not necessarily a big deal but it's just kind of set him back a week or two um num- number eight Kyder Montero got into a game the other day we actually had uh put together a video cut it up uh, threw it up uh, or I, I put it up on my personal account and I've said this before because I'm, I'm always worried that at some point Major League Baseball is just going to crack down on send- using their video on Twitter somehow uh, so I put it on my own just in case it gets, uh, you know, shut down. But we retweeted it from the minor league account, and you could see that. And he looked he looked pretty good. I think it was one hit, one strikeout, some hard hit balls, but they're right at people and and generally throwing strikes. And that's a good sign for a guy in the forty man. Yeah, throwing ninety six, ninety seven, no problem. And yeah. same thing. I had a chance to talk to him a little bit in camp, and he is beyond stoked to be there. And so I think he's going to. He also had a really cool NASA hat or uh, shirt on during the Tiger mm. barbecue. Like he, some of those guys are really fashionistas and he had a <laughs> interesting Nash, NASA shirt. Cause it just stands out. You don't see me, too many people with NASA shirts like that. And so, but beyond that, honestly, Montero's slider, it, 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 so much to his pitching rapport. It'll be interesting where we'll see him start the season. I mean, I know that Brandon day has been a big, Ontario bandwagon guy now and carrying that train. So we're carrying the water, if you will. But I, I don't know. I, it's, I want him to start. And then there's also just throwing the bullpen, but either way, I think that he has definitely been impressive in camp so far. That leads to number seven too. Speaking of having an impressive camp, just in Malloy. Yeah. Uh, you know, that was, that was cool to see. And his his it was the first game on TV, wasn't it? And uh, gets a single, I think he got three hits, didn't he? Or maybe they changed one to an error. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think they hit, changed one to an error, I think. And then got a home run in his next at bat. Really crushed it. It was nice. Uh, has a walk, has a strikeout. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't 
you know, he's played some outfield, but we didn't get to see him on defense in that game. It was a DH, but uh, yeah, I mean, he's a guy that, that we talk about, you know, he's got a chance to make the roster. He's not on the 40 man. So that's always going to hinder you a little bit, but he's, uh, you know, if he hits and keeps hitting and shows power they they'll find a way to get him on the, on the big league club because, you know, there's still need offense on the, on the team, but he's doing what he needs to do so far. So that, that's, it's good to see. And, uh, yeah, it's fun to see him make, do some damage. Um, no sign of Kevin McGonigal. Probably won't get one. <laughs> probably won't see McGonigal. Or number two, Job. Or number three, Clark. We may see Job, but yeah. but Max Clark and McGonigal probably not. But uh, number five, Jace Young has been in several games. He hasn't gotten a start yet. Hench did say that he was going to get a couple starts, I think, in the spring. Uh, and also at second, too. Not just yeah. at third. Yeah, and he's yeah he's played a little at second. He's played a little at third. 0 for 3 so far. Uh has a walk and a strikeout and an RBI. Um, did make a nice diving stop. It sounded like on the radio at second base the other day, and 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 actually threw, like you know, got the lead runner at second base. So he diving towards first base and turned around and, and threw to second. But we know he's just you know, a solid second baseman. So nothing really new to report there. Hasn't done a ton at third base yet to really let us know. But uh, I think they they seem fairly comfortable with him at third base. Yeah, there's been no as far as where he's going to end up at. I think the the one thing that has been abundantly clear that Hinch wants to see more of Young this year. You, there is a good chance if Young does what he's supposed to do, you could see him in midseason at some point. So that that is the, the not only is the organization high on him, Hinch is high on him, high on him as well. So that goes just I think what will be interesting is we all thought that maybe he get set time at third, but when Hinch said, oh, he'll see time at second, that's just, again, adding to that, keeping everybody versatile, because that's what Hinch wants. He wants that versatility. Yeah, and it's, you know, I, I get the the desire to like, oh, but we, we need to see him work at third base. It's like, yeah, well, you know what, they you want to you use all the muscles all the time, because you never know. Maybe Keith gets hurt, right? And they go, okay, let's bring up Young to play second base, or, you know, God forbid, but uh, you know what I mean? Like, like they just want to make sure that he's ready and, and gets reps everywhere, game reps. Um, our number four prospect, Parker Meadows. Uh, so far, so good, right? Two for six with a double and a couple of strikeouts. I saw he got beat on an end zone ch- change up the other day. That seemed a little unfair this early in spring training, but uh, he's going to have to get used to those. So, uh, yeah, I, I have no idea how he hit the double today. It was a double to right field to Tyler Nevin. Um, Former Tigers, great, but uh, yeah, without again, without camera, without radio, without Statcast, we really have no idea how well he hit it. But uh, frankly, I don't really care. It could yeah. have been a dribbler past first base, and he sprinted it to second. But that's all we're kind of hoping for from from Meadows this year is just get on base a little bit, get some extra bases, play great defense in center, and so far so good. Which brings yeah. us to number one, yes, Mr. Cole Keith, who since day one at camp has looked like he's belonged there. I mean, if there's one thing that and I, after the contract stuff, again, it's being a dead horse with that, really. The guy has got out there. He just wants to go out there and play. And it's as simple as that. That's just, there's been one thing about Cole Keith is just he does not look like a rookie out there. I mean, he's been taking first team drills for everything. He's just, he he's fluent on his, it was an interesting question we got last week on the podcast about his size and whether he can play second base. And he, he plays second just fine. Again no issues playing and in, in playing the position whatsoever. And so I, I think the the biggest impression that I got too was the way he came back after striking out pretty quickly in the first two at-bats, came back and took a slider and went opposite field. And that's what Cole Keith does. And that's something that I – it was something where in the press box, I remember Evan looked at me and goes, oh, so I'm like, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke up people's asses when I say when – in terms of like offensive bats, it was just one of those things where, especially early on in camp, it was evident why he was why he got this contract. It's evident why he is the number one prospect in the system for a reason. He's just he he looks like he belongs out there. He's not he maybe it was just a jitters, but you knew like that third at bat. It was almost like wait for it. And he yeah, it, it's yeah. I mean, he, he's three for eight this spring in three games. He does have three strikeouts, but and started with those two, with the first two at bats, I think, right? 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, okay, first real live game reps, not a huge surprise. Two of his hits to the opposite field, including that one you, you saw. Uh, and then the one today absolutely smoked a double to the right center field gap. Uh, barreled it up, literal barrel, uh, 360 feet, 106 miles an hour off the bat. Um, and I, you know, I was expecting him to do that. Yeah. I, I think he's one of those guys. It's like, like Riley green. You, you can, you can watch the game day app and you go, okay, I'm, I'm going to see in play runs soon. <laughs> or it's good because he just, he, 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 he's a really good hitter. And, um, uh, he'll get some walks as the spring goes along and, and he'll be fine, but he's gonna, he's gonna be an impact bat. Uh, again, it, would, it, it may take him a while once he starts facing the best, the best every day, but he's got all the, the tools to succeed. And, and I think he's gonna, so it's, it's a nice start. And uh, again, not shocking to us at all that he's off to a solid start in spring. So, because uh, that's what he do. That's what he does. And you know, it's funny. Evan and I, and I think it was somebody else too, started recording his at bats in the press box. On Saturday, I mean, the press box was kind of packed anyways, because the, when the Yankees come to town, they, they, their, their media comes pretty heavy. And so you don't really have a lot of room once you sit down because it's not as spacious per se than Comerica Park. It's Lakeland. And, but Evan's behind me. I was right there. And as soon as Cole, I saw that I was looking around because I was waiting for Tigers PR to go, no, you can't do that. But it was, we had, it was, you had, it was like must once watch at a bat. And I, and there was, I think him and Dingler, I think had the best at bats that day because Dingler came back too from a, like an O2 deficit, uh, two O2 count came back did pretty well, pop one over the left field, and I was looking at him especially because we saw this last year, Chris, where Dingler had a lot of quick at bats, and it was just kind of sometimes he would have a really good at like eleven pitch at bat, and then you just strike out in three pitches, but Cole Keith, again, just kind of those uh, consistent. And like he he did strike out on I think the three pitches the first time. But yeah. That being said, it's almost like he again adjustment adjustment adjustment. He just somehow he he knows what he's looking for. He'll lay off, and then he'll do something like he'll just like he does. The, I remember then he tell us I think too that if he puts it on app uh, the opposite field by accident. Yeah, he said he's not. He doesn't mean to do that, and, and I'm sure that's true. But like he's not looking to hit to the opposite field, but there's something about his swing and his process that allows him to do that pretty consistently. <laughs> like it's yeah. not a fluke when he hits the ball, the opposite field, he, he does that all the time. Um, so, you know, I was, it was funny. I was just going through the exit velocities from today's game against the blue Jays. And there were, uh, let's see, we got six balls hit over 105 miles an hour. Arelvis Martinez, <laughs> two of them, 111 and 108, I actually one up 109 beast for Toronto. Uh, Torkelson, 110.2 on his double. That's actually like the 11th hardest ball or 10th hardest hit ball he's ever hit, hit uh, as a pro, spring training and regular season. Number four, Eddie's Leonard, 106.1. And then Colt Keith's double, 105.8. And then Riley Green, uh, a little bit below at 103. And then another Eddie's Leonard, 101.5. So, yeah, some 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 hard contact made today. And, uh, you know, I don't think Tigers fans will be too upset if Torkelson, Green, and Keith are barreling up the ball every game because uh, that's the recipe for a lot of success. Honestly, I'm still miffed by the Dodgers why they let him like that whole trade happen with Eddie Leonard. That was one of those where I don't know. It, it, the numbers didn't, for what he was doing in Tulsa, he was down there. He was young. Well, he was before he got traded to the Tigers, he was already kind of young for his age down there. He was on the 40 man at 1.2. So it was maybe like they thought that no one would go underneath the radar or something. But well, you know, I, I think I think they needed a spot on the 40 man after at the trade deadline. And like like you said, you know, the, the his numbers, his his traditional numbers weren't great at Tulsa. I'm looking 254. He did have 11 home runs, but um this is a 96 WRC plus. You know, it was like he's fine. But I'm sure the underlying data was great because it, the, the data was great in Toledo. And, you know, the Tigers got him, pushed him up a level, and he was really good. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's it was a shrewd acquisition by the Tigers. You do wonder if maybe he had been part of the Eduardo Rodriguez trade in some capacity, and they just figured out a way to get him anyway. Uh, but, yeah, the, uh, among, the, among the Scott Harris moves since he's become GM, and we haven't seen him do anything in the big leagues yet, but, but that one – 
was creative and and we talked about this on the Motor City Metrics podcast, but the the acquisition of the prep left-hander from the Padres for international pool money was pretty shrewd and, and interesting. And that's a guy that that could very easily find his way onto our next top 30 prospect list if he's um you know actually healthy and pitching this year presumably in lakeland they might keep him hold hold him back for the the complex league but complex league is a month earlier this year so we'll know pretty quickly um and and his name is escaping me what's uh no i'm, I'm trying dickerson? to find it now blake dickerson, dickerson is that right yeah, blake dickerson yeah and then harris when you spoke to us about that about picking him up they they were fans of him for a while so it was like somebody that I think they could have drafted the one in the draft, but I think San Diego's drafted them first. So they might have had ideas to get them then. Yeah. And they said they saw him. He was on Team USA with Max Clark and Kevin McGonigal. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 there's not a huge difference between him and Paul Wilson, who uh, I think, uh, you know, who they took in the third round. So that's a couple of fun young lefties and, and another interesting player to keep it a, keep an eye on. Remember, so, yeah, kudos to that. Kudos for the Eddie's Leonard, and uh, I don't know. I'm looking forward. This is one of one of my favorite things about early spring training is how many of our, you know, the, the prospects get into these games. The minor leaguers, they they you know, the big leaguers are done after two at bats or five innings or whatever, and these the young guys get a chance to get out there. And sometimes the games get absolutely wacky. You know, they're not playing facing big leaguers, so you can't judge them a ton. But it's just fun to see them out there and and get into the action. So I. Yeah, I'm enjoying spring training so far. It's nice to have some baseball back. Yeah, especially when you see the random 87s, 89 numbers too, which is always indicative indicative of the when the minors are going, minor league players are going to show up. Especially when you see Saturday, for example, when they literally were running out running out of pitchers. I mean, we still we kill Hernandez, who I think would probably would have not pitched at all, but that was interesting to see him. And then yeah, they had a guy who I never heard of. That the first guy that came in, and I think it was somebody from the I want, I want to say it was oh it was Calvin Co- Calvin Coker. Well, yeah, Calvin Coker. They also had Matt brought in Matt Merrill, I believe. Yeah, Matt Merrill. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, some of these minor league signings, offseason minor league signings, that were, uh, you know, it's uh, kind of easy to forget. Um, what did uh... and Coker, by the way, was teammates with Casey Mize at Auburn. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you know what? I think I think we looked that up when they acquired him, right? We we're like, yeah. oh, was he was was Coker a minor league rule five guy then? I don't uh... know. I don't know. Uh, one thing I'll say is when I was I was trying to remember Dickerson's name. Yeah, he was, was a looking, he was a rule five drafted. That's a drafted. Go ahead, as you were saying. I was I was looking up uh, Dickerson and I found a young man by the name of Buttercup Dickerson in the Baseball Reference, a, a five foot six, one hundred forty pound outfielder who played for the Cincinnati Reds. In 1878, Buttercup Dickerson. Buttercup Dickerson. Five, five, six, 140. Wow. So he was Ooh. pretty good early on. Four, 13, uh, 14 triples in 19 or 1879 led the league. I don't know who else was in the league in 1879, but uh, Buttercup. Buttercup. There, there you go. But as far as the rest of the prospects go, we'll keep an eye out on anything that comes up. There Again, there's so many... File lines we mentioned we mentioned earlier with Drew Robinson, uh, the potential with some more arms coming down the it just in terms of where they're gonna end up at. So we'll, we'll keep it posted. There'll be Jerry. I know I think Jerry's gonna I think there's an article Jerry's dropping. I think I have to edit it, but beyond that, there should be some other stuff coming up on the Tigers Under League Report website. Go to tigersmlreport.com. Check out all the great content. Our top 30 prospect list is up there. Chris is animated appearance, or he he has been out there and he's oh, trying shoot, to get did back. We, did we not mention that? I did. I, I skip over him. Yeah, I, think I, you I did. might have. Yeah, he 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 struck out, but it was uh, a strikeout looking on a very questionable pitch, <laughs> which uh, is shocking in like the seventh inning or eighth inning in the minor league game. But yeah, he he saw he saw it at bat. He and Campos have both seen one plate appearance, so they're they're out there. They exist. Yeah, we'll see what they will they what as time goes on, how much more we'll see these guys. It was also good to see Andrew Navagato after the way he ended the season last year. I just wanted to give a shout out to him because he ended the season on a horrific, questionable injury where his shoulder, yeah, I think raid force. Yeah, yeah, was yeah. Stupid play. Uh, yeah, really, uh, one of the, the the you know worst 
injuries you'll see on a baseball field in terms of just you know destruction to somebody's body it's oh, yeah. uh, outside of like like a compound fracture or something like that uh so yeah it's definitely good to see him back, back out there they've been using him as, as a shortstop and late in these games and you know it's uh he's been a, a a good player in the system for several years now so definitely nice to see him like we, we i mentioned lyle lockhart got into a game it was cool to see a lot of these guys who are big parts of erie's team last year have, have seen some action and we're for it because you know we're that was a fun team championship level team last year they're going to be getting rings this year i'm not quite entirely sure how they're going to distribute them i assume that they'll just you know mail them to everybody who played a part but i don't think anybody's gonna like i don't think colt keith's gonna uh, you know fly into erie to get his ring <laughs> it would be funny if he did like the stop he took a quick flight in you know did the yeah. whole wave and then just got back on a plane and played a game like that that'd be that'd be fantastic yeah and and erie's opening day is the day after the, the, the total solar eclipse is going to roll through erie so if you happen to be in town yeah they're especially speaking, speaking of which to uh, book our hotel because something about that will be they were talking about rooms selling out pretty fast up there so on that note though thank you so much for listening to the tiger Mountain League podcast Again, go to TigersNetworkReport.com for all content. There'll be a written, some written stuff coming out for us here shortly. We're cutting up videos. We've done some videos, but again, with just Mother Nature kicking our asses and everything the way it's been, it's been a slow go as of late, but we'll be cranking out stuff before you know it. Also, go check us out on MotorCityBangles.com, or excuse me, MotorCityBangles. Well, well, I am writing an article for there technically, but. What is the metrics podcast? If you haven't subscribed to that, please like and subscribe us on YouTube. And that's where we talk about all things Detroit Tigers. And we have Cameron now as our main producer, which is a nice addition to the staff, our small but mighty staff. And so, um, and also want to give a shout out to Jerry, dude. Jerry's been killing it on yeah. Twitter lately with some of these questions. So Jerry's yeah, been, he's he's man. fighting fighting back. Not fighting back, but he's like, yeah, like calling people out for their BS and and he's yeah, it's good to see Jerry spread his wings. Yeah, Jerry's not that quiet guy anymore that likes Legos. He's out there. He's kicking ass and taking names. All right, so we'll be back next week as we'll take a look at some of them. We'll continue to look at the minor league stats. Players that will, again, we'll kind of have a better idea of as probably within the, I think the cuts are going to be coming up next week, I want to say. Yeah, I think we'll start seeing guys get sent to minor league camp pretty soon. Yeah, so there'll be a better, clearer idea of what's going on. As far as the Toledo opener, too, is the end of March. That's a home opener. And Toledo's going to be a fun roster. But, yeah, as these cuts continue to happen, we'll probably be doing a weekly podcast. And, like I said, the videos will be cranking out over on our YouTube channel. So, for myself and Chris Brown, we'll talk to you next week. Have a good week, everybody.